this is one of the driest places on, on Earth. Sometimes it feels like being on the Moon or Mars. During the day is a fantastic place, but during the night is absolutely astonishing. Hi everybody, welcome back to this journey through the extreme universe. I'm Alba Fernandez Barral. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator of the CTA Observatory. And today in this third stop of our journey, we have a very interesting topic. We're going to talk about the energetic cosmic race and to do so we have our mission commander, Alexander. But first let me remind you, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar or if you want to already share with us where you're watching us from, I saw already people saying they are, uh, they are watching us from France and, and Brazil. Please go to our Facebook and YouTube, leave a comment there. As you know, as usual, we are going to have a question and answer session at the very end of the event. We are going to pick some of those questions and Alexander will try to answer them. And with this, uh, let me already invite Alexander to join me. Uh, hi, Alexander, how are you? Hi, fine. Thanks for being well. here today. Yes. So let me introduce you for those who doesn't um, know you. Alexander is a staff researcher at the CNRS at the Montpellier Universe and Particles Laboratory in the south of France. He's a member of the HES collaboration and also a member of the CTA consortium. And his main field of research is more on the theoretical part. He works on the cosmic ray acceleration and transport in our own galaxy and also in the modeling of the gamma ray emission from cosmic sources. So with this, Alexander, thanks again for being here and yeah. all yours. Thank you, Alba. So um, hello, everyone. So this is the third stop for this uh, journey through extreme universe. And this stop is, uh, is about cosmic rays and star forming regions. So what can we, we see with this Cherenkov telescope array? So my name is, uh, as Alba told you, as Alexander Markovit. I'm, I'm working in the laboratory of uh, universe and particle of Montpellier. You can see my email address below. So if in case, just in case you have a further question, uh, don't hesitate to send it to me afterward. So, <clears throat> cosmic ray. So usually when I'm doing some uh, out, out, outreach talk, I like to put, uh, let's say a kind of summary. So you have one the talk in one slide and uh, then Eventually, you can leave if you if you want after after this this slide. So, which tend to summarize uh, the, the the problem I would like to discuss with you tonight. So, cosmic rays. Uh, so we can may ask a couple of basic questions. So, what are cosmic rays? So the answer is that they are mostly protons. So. Uh, say uh, subnuclear particles moving at uh, speeds which are very close to the speed of light. So we say that they, they are relativistic. So I'm, I may use this work uh, all along the, 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 the talk. So I define it here. So relativistic, that means that uh, particles are moving close to the speed of light and that can be described by the special relativity theory of Albert Einstein, uh, which is was uncovered in the 1905. So when cosmic rays have been discovered, they have been discovered, in fact, uh, a few years later in, uh, by Victor Hess uh, in uh, 1912. And um, for long, they were mostly thought to come from uh, our sun. And actually, most of the cosmic rays are produced by our sun, and it is really uh, a real difficulty because of radiation hazard for uh, astronauts which want to go to Mars. For, uh, this is a real, real problem to solve. But uh, uh, a fraction of th these particles are uh, at higher energies are coming from the deep space in uh, our galaxy. And exactly, we don't still uh, know where they're coming from exactly. 
is still a bit of mystery of modern astrophysics. But as you will see, massive stars are the main suspects of uh, cosmic rays accelerators or uh, sources. So one way to answer uh, uh, where they come from, they are coming from, uh, is through gamma rays. And uh, so just a, a few words about gamma rays. So gamma rays, it's uh, high frequency light. Uh, or with very energetic photons. So just come back on the electromagnetic spectrum that you may have seen this uh, several times already, just to, to make things uh, more precise. Uh, here is display this electromagnetic spectrum in terms of the, the frequency. So from uh, left, you have radio. Uh, and then uh, as you are going toward uh, right, you are going through microwave infrared and then uh, the visible uh, window, which is a very teeny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then you have ultraviolet, violet, and X-rays. And at the edge of, uh, of this uh, spectrum, you have gamma rays. Uh, so gamma rays are extremely energetic and at a very high frequency. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, in astrophysics are produced by cosmic rays. This is why this, this, this is, uh, there is a strong connection between the two cosmic rays and gamma rays. So again, don't mix up these two uh, uh, um, uh, rays. So you have a cosmic ray, which are subnuclear particles and gamma rays, which are electromagnetic radiation or photons, if you prefer to to think in terms of particles. So this, these are particles of different nature. <clears throat> okay, so once we have uh, defined this everything, um, uh, let's move to a brief history of cosmic ray research. So, in fact, it was uh, that we, we had some hints about uh, cosmic rays for long. Uh, we have before the uh, Victor S discovery, we can go back to the late 18th century uh, when Charles de Coulomb, who is a, a well known French physicist, uh, discovered uh, that uh, his uh, electroscopes, that is uh, um, an instrument which is, uh, uh, helps to uh, calculate the charge, you have the electric charge. <clears throat> uh, naturally, uh, this charge, when they, they he, he charge the, the electroscope, so on the, on the, here you have a a charged electroscope, so you, the, the two uh, leaves are repel each other because you have the same charge on both sides. And then he put this electroscope in a room, and then uh, after some time, uh, he find that the, it is discharged, and uh, it was uh, for him uh, quite isolated. So there is an action of the the air in discharging this electroscope, and he was wondering why. And this was later confirmed by the well renowned. Uh, physicists like Faraday and Crookes. Then uh, by the end of the 19th century, there have been, of, you, you should know, the discovery of radioactivity, so where matter is emitting radiation. And actually, if you put uh, some radioactive uh, element nearby an electroscope, it will also naturally discharge. And so uh, uh, people also uh, know, uh, know at that uh, stage that, uh, in fact, um, <coughs> That is because hair is uh, uh, carrying radiation and which provoke this discharge. But okay, so where are these uh, radiation coming from? Uh, what is from Earth crust or from space? Actually, in fact, you know that uh, in uh, uh, granitic uh, stones there are some uh, radioactivity. So it was not so silly to to think that. It we are coming from crust. Uh, so, and the idea of Victor S to test this uh, question was to to, to uh, um, take some uh, electroscope in uh, some balloon uh, flights at uh, high altitudes and to test this uh, discharge as a function of the altitude. So, Victor S was uh, an Australian <coughs> physicist. And he, he made a series of uh, balloon flight over 
Australia and the actual Czech Republic and also in, the, in uh, Germany in the years 1912, 1913. So with a balloon uh, above uh, 5,000 uh, meters uh, with uh, so an unbarked electroscope and he evaluates uh, the time to, for the, the electroscope to get discharged as, as, a, as a function of the altitude and he found that in fact this uh, intensity of the uh, radi radiation uh, was increasing with uh, the altitude. So he found the, the, the answer that uh, the radiating uh, the radiation were coming from uh, space. And so he was inspired because uh, with this discovery, he got the Nobel Prize in physics in uh, 1936. No, of course, we continue on uh, the research on uh, accumulating information on cosmic rays. And here is the current status of uh, uh, cosmic ray uh, flux. So I present you the cosmic ray energy flux. That is, if you take an instrument of some size, some surface, so surface, and you, you wait for a given of time, you've got uh, uh, given a quantity of energy uh, coming through this uh, instrument. So you have an energy per unit of surface and time. This is uh, the incoming flux. Here is, is represented as a, as a function of the uh, energy of the incoming particle. <clears throat> and so as you can see, you have a, a, a flux which is rapidly decreasing as function of the en particle energy. Most of the, the cosmic rays produced by the sun are at this energy, around uh, one G, G, giga electron volt. And then most of uh, all cosmic rays are, are at higher energy are coming from the deeper space. So just to make things uh, more precise, what is uh, an elect uh, electron volt uh, connected? So in fact, 10 trillions uh, uh, electron volt is about one joule. This is a standard unit of to measure energy. And if you want one uh, uh, giga electron volt is 10 billion times more energetic than the visible light if you want to think about the energy of photons. So you see that the flux is rapidly decreasing such that at the highest energies, about 10 to the 19, uh, 10 to the 10 giga electron volt, you only, uh, it is only left one particle per kilometer square per century. Stati statistically, if you have a detector of uh, one kilometer square, you have to wait 100 years to detect one particle. So we can still uh, detect uh, this particle at this energy because we have detectors which cover a uh, lot of kilometers square, about uh, uh, 3,000. So we don't have to wait one century uh, to detect them. So it is really impressive because this one particle of uh, size of, uh, let's say, one uh, quadrillion meters, um, uh, so as as much as energy of uh, let's say a few tens of joules so in, at the matter of comparison you can uh, the one around 100 joules is the energy you have in the tennis ball <coughs> saved by a, a, a professional player so you have as much as an, an energy in this teeny particle as in a tennis ball saved by, uh, by for instance this guy Ivo Karlovic which has uh, the world record Okay, <clears throat> so, um, but then, so I did not yet answer where they are coming from, and uh, this is really a kind of challenge because um, also they are really energetic, and what we can do at best for now is uh, to accelerate this particle. It's really difficult, and what we can do at best for, for now, it's for instance at the CERN, you know this uh, accelerator, we can reach at best around 10 tera electron volts, so about two millions of joules. So you see, you, you have a factor of uh, one billion uh, of, uh, let's say, sorry, of uh, one million less uh, or a bit more uh, than uh, what is observed in, in cosmic rays. So how hell can we accelerate this particle up to this 100 joules? 
this is really challenging and uh, this uh, conduct me to say a few words about massive stars because massive stars are the main suspects to accelerate these particles. So, some words about massive stars. So, massive stars are the most luminous and short lifetimes stars in our galaxy. You can find them in the so-called Hirschsprung-Russell diagram. So, from the name of the two astronomers. So, where, where you, this is a way to uh, display uh, the stars uh, depending on the, the, their luminosity and the, their temperature. So, you can see uh, the, our sun is uh, right in the middle <coughs> of the uh, main sequence. Uh, this is quite standard star, let's say. And uh, this, is, this main sequence is where the, the stars are spending most of their life. So let's say uh, from uh, young, st uh, after being young, so they are adult uh, lifetime, let's say. And when they are get, get, getting uh, retired, they are moving to other uh, branches, which are, uh, for instance, for the most massive star, which are the O and B stars, which are very luminous and very hot, uh, high temperature. So they are mostly radiating in the blue and a lot of UV radiation. They are moving into a branch, which is a super giant branch. And there you can find some quite uh, well-known uh, objects like uh, Betelgeuse, uh, which is a well-known uh, star you can see on the Orion, Orion uh, constellation uh, during winter. It's a kind of uh, reddish uh, star you can see at the age of the or, or young uh, 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 quadrilateral. But, uh, okay, just to give uh, you a test about these uh, massive stars, um, uh, so they can be quite luminous and their luminosity is, is scaling at the, at the cube of their mass. So, and uh, they can get really luminous. And uh, for instance, uh, let's say, I think most of, top two, maybe most massive star uh, in our galaxy, uh, not in our galaxy, but known uh, massive stars, is this one. Is, he has, uh, this star has this, uh, this phone number, uh, 135-6A1. And in fact, this star is, uh, is not in our galaxy, it's in a large Magellanic clouds, which is a, a, a near, very nearby um, irregular galaxy to or, or Milky Way. It is located in the Tarantula Nebula. And just to give you an idea of the different size, here it's a, more or less a realistic uh, size comparison between our sun and this uh, star. So it's a monster. And here you have Earth. Um, so this star is uh, about 225 solar masses. And um, it's a, it's a distance of uh, Magellanic clouds. Um, so just to keep in mind that uh, one solar mass is uh, huge of uh, matter. Huh? It's about uh, uh, ten to the uh, to billion of billion of billion of tons, and the solar luminosity is uh, about uh, the same, but in watts. Okay, so sorry. Uh, Okay, massive star cluster. So, the point of uh, massive stars is that uh, they have some kind of uh, gregarious instinct that they do not like to to be isolated. So, it's, of course, it's a joke. Um, it's just the way they are formed from the from the the matter in the interstellar medium through the gravitational collapse. They form at the center of the of the, the cloud where. Uh, which is uh, subject to this gravitational collapse in a way which is not yet fully understood. <clears throat> but usually, so they form uh, in groups and uh, they form those what we call massive star clusters. And here you have an example. So still of this Tarantula nebula in the large Magellanic cloud. And so are the, the, the star I, I described previously is uh, at the center of this uh, on this uh, cluster here and you see that uh, this cluster of star is uh, is uh, have a, a strong impact over the the interstellar medium it 
uh, it, it can carve some uh, some holes in the interstellar medium through the strong powerful winds you have inside and so you have a strong effect of uv radiation which uh, produce some uh, in, uh, impact in the environment so you have some kind of bubbles which are created uh, here by the this uh, massive star radiation this is a Chandra image. It's not uh, uh, light. It's, it's a false color. It's X-rays, in fact. So most, as I told you, the most of these uh, massive stars are in cluster, about 60% to be more exact. And so, as I told you, massive stars are, have a, a, a short lifetime, and they end as a spectacular events, which are uh, name as a supernovae. So, <clears throat> ah. so supernovae explosion. Uh, so, massive star with mass greater than eight solar masses uh, uh, produce uh, supernovae. So, which are uh, what is a supernovae? It's a, a spectacular explosion where uh, a, a lot of uh, mass about one solar masses is expelled uh, by a shock wave which is moving through the through the star from the from the the, the deep inside of the star through the the envelope of the of the star and expel the matter of the of the star in the interstellar medium here you have an example uh, <clears throat> and so of such uh, uh, events. I don't know if you can see here the supernova uh, appearing in this uh, nearby galaxy, but the luminosity at the peak of the supernova is is not uh, uh, ridiculously uh, smaller than the lu luminosity of the whole galaxy. Um, here you, you just have to look at the blue curve, which is uh, the supernova produced by the massive star. You have another type of supernova, but I have no, no time to go through. <clears throat> um, so after the explosion, uh, supernova, uh, at, at the earth of, the, of this uh, supernova, you have a compact object is formed, either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the initial mass of the star, and also other parameters. Then another uh, site where you can find a lot of massive star. Sorry, again, it's moving too fast. Is a starburst galaxies. Starburst galaxies, in fact, is a is a is a phase of galaxy evolution, where you have a, a kind of, uh, for some period, you have a bursting uh, uh, of, uh, of star formation. So. Actually, in our galaxy, uh, our galaxy converts uh, about uh, two, three solar mass uh, per year as stars. So, from from the matter in the interstellar medium, you take in whole whole galaxy about let's say two solar masses of uh, interstellar matter is converted per year in our galaxy as star. In starburst galaxy, you can have uh, a factor can be a factor of 50 higher. So it's a really uh, a huge difference where you have a, a lot of, uh, of star forming. And uh, so one consequence of this is that you form more massive star and then you have more supernova explosion in the starburst galaxies. This is why these starburst galaxies are of our interest. And uh, for instance, so you can have, have uh, up to uh, 30 supernova in this galaxy per century. Actually, in our Milky Way, we have typically a uh, factor of 10 less, about three supernova per century. So here is an example of such a starburst galaxy. So the, the well-known Messier 82 galaxy, uh, which is uh, here you, it's in, um, from H alpha. You see a very nice filaments which are uh, produced from the nu nuclei of the galaxy. And uh, so you have very powerful winds which are Powered by this, uh, by the energy input from the massive star, and here it's it's a supernova which appear in the, in this uh, in this galaxy. Okay, so let's come back to cosmic rays. So the links between massive star and cosmic rays. Sorry, it's moving too fast. I don't know why. <laughs> um, 
so um yes so once you have a, a supernova explosion you um you have a so um uh, the matter of the star which is dispersed into the interstellar medium and here you have an image a beautiful image uh, taken from uh, the chandra uh, uh, telescope at x-rays um, <clears throat> and here you can see in this image uh, uh, so the matter of the star inside the ejecta which is so called so you have different color depending on the element and uh, here I, it's uh, an, an animated uh, image so uh, Chandra has taken several images over the years from 2000 to 2015 so you see clearly the expansion of the of the supernova remnant and at the edge you have some this blue uh, em emission which is actually is not matter from the star but matter from the interstellar medium which has been shocked by a, a strong shock which is moving into the interstellar medium at a very high speed here it, for Tycho supernova remnant it is about five thousand kilometer per second and i don't know if you can see well but you have a very thin filaments behind this shock and actually these filaments are produced by cosmic rays they are produced by cosmic ray electrons not protons <clears throat> and uh, this is so-called synchrotron radiation so you have some explanation of one backup slide if you want some uh, which is a radiation of by a relative stick particle uh, in a magnetic field and from this, uh, the sides of this filament, we can deduce the amplitude of the magnetic field behind the shock. And what is found from this side is that, uh, in fact, actually, the magnetic field is strongly amplified at the shock. And this is likely very connected to the acceleration of cosmic rays. So we have uh, strong hints that um, <clears throat> cosmic rays are produced in this uh, supernova remnants. <clears throat> Another way to probe this is to go through gamma rays. Because as uh, you see here, we only see the radiation from electrons, not from protons. And gamma rays can help to see the radiation from protons. So this is the uh, most uh, uh, abundant uh, population in the cosmic ray. Um, OK. So gamma ray, so gamma ray astronomy. If I arrived, yes. So you have already heard a bit about this. Uh, gamma ray astronomy on ground is a relatively recent uh, um, uh, field in uh, astrophysics. It has been developed since uh, the, um, uh, the onset of the Whipple Observatory in, uh, in 1968. Um, and it is based on the detection of Cherenkov light. So you have uh, also some definition of Cherenkov lights in the backup slide, <clears throat> which is in fact the, the light produced by the gamma rays as they hit the, the Earth atmosphere. Uh, fortunately, gamma rays cannot arrive to the ground, otherwise we will not be here to discuss uh, about cosmic rays. They will, everything will be uh, destroyed. And so while uh, cosmic rays uh, uh, reach the Earth atmosphere, they produce some secondary particles which themselves radiate this Cherenkov radiation, which is in the, let's say, in the blue, uh, in the blue uh, range of, uh, of uh, visible light. And uh, the idea then uh, is to have a uh, large uh, deflector. So here you have in red, uh, what uh, you got from uh, from the emission from the gamma rays. So these gamma rays and this secondary particle produce a Cherenkov light, which is reflected in these mirrors, which then goes back to the camera, which is here, which converts the, the, the signal of uh, light into uh, electrons, so into uh, electricity. And um, uh, let's say, so it, it, it that uh, it helps to uh, uh, reconstruct an image of these uh, so-called showers of uh, radiation in the atmosphere on on the on the uh, on the camera. So here it's a pixelized camera, and you have different pixel and the, the, the form of the of the gamma emission. From the size of it, we, you can reconstruct the, the energy of the primary gamma ray. And so the first detection was done by the Whipple 
uh, observatory in uh, in uh, Arizona, and they detect in the the Crab Nebula in the late uh, uh, eight, uh, 80s. Um, uh, this Crab Nebula is uh, in fact associated with uh, supernova explosion, uh, which occurred in uh, uh, 1054. So, <clears throat> gamma rays and cosmic ray and massive stars. No, uh, of course, we did not wait for a CTA to to observe this cosmic ray source. There are some already uh, ongoing instruments which are taking data, which are basically the th these three: uh, S, Magic, and Veritas. S in Namibia, Magic in Canary Islands, and Verita in uh, Arizona. Uh, sorry. And so we have already uh, some gamma ray, ray emission from these uh, objects. Um, but as you see, uh, the, the definition, let's say, of the gamma ray emission is not as good as uh, at other wavelengths. So it's less, less detailed. It's more blurred. Uh, um, this is because of uh, we do not have much photons and also because of the, the technology itself. But whatever, this is enough to, to to uh, investigate the cosmic ray acceleration in these objects. And here I, I show you three types of examples. Here are the gamma ray supernova remnants. So most of the well-known historical supernova remnants in our galaxy, so the supernova remnant which has been observed during the history, reported from uh, Chinese astronomy and then uh, uh, European astronomy, uh, I've been uh, detected uh, with gamma rays, to the exception of one. Um, then uh, we have gamma rays from uh, this uh, Messier 82 uh, 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 Starburst galaxy, as you can see here. You, you see it again, the, the strong outflow and, um, and the, the nucleus here. And so gamma rays here in, uh, in uh, in green uh, is, has been detected by Hess collaboration. And finally, here you can see uh, also uh, a detection from a massive star cluster in our galaxy, which is called Vestalon 2. Here, the, the image in background is not from gamma ray astronomy, it's uh, from Spitzer uh, satellites, so sensitive in the infrared. And in, um, in the white contours, you can see the, the gamma ray emission. So, the contours is like a uh, um, uh, contour of uh, a similar altitude on the map. Uh, it, it connects uh, the, the point with similar flux. And so the, at the center, you have the stronger flux. And so uh, gamma rays are, are produced by this cosmic ray through different channels, which is in the back of three uh, slides, which is a bit more technical. So I come back on this if, if you, you have any questions. Just a few words about Cherenkov Telescope Array. Um, you, uh, of course, uh, you already know this, but <clears throat> so uh, this is the next generation of uh, Cherenkov Telescope, which get an, an star on, uh, in the two sites, so in the Canary Islands on the site of the MAGIC uh, uh, Telescope, and another one in the Paraná, Chile, nearby uh, other instruments you have. In the, uh, for uh, Europeans uh, Thousand Observatory. Um, so here you have three types of, uh, we'll have three types of telescope, uh, large, medium size, and small size. And um, of course, uh, simultaneous detection by several uh, telescopes, you can do some image, uh, you can reconstruct some several, the same uh, uh, shower or emission from uh, the secondaries uh, by the gamma rays on uh, uh, one uh, the camera. Those so you have different images, and then you can uh, have a better reconstruction of the uh, primary uh, gamma ray energy and direction. This is a so-called stereoscopic uh, uh, system. So, what can we learn with uh, about cosmic ray and gamma rays with CTAs? So, oh, fortunately. Unfortunately, this is an ongoing work, so I cannot show you any plot <laughs> or any figure. But so I, I can say you a few words about this in, uh, in one or two minutes. 
So what we should expect, uh, first of all, is, of course, confirm the previous detection with more accuracy because CTA will be more sensitive. So we will have more accurate uh, data, let's say. So a better understanding of the source uh, energetic physics. Then what we can do is, um, if I can go back to, let's say, uh, this one. What we can do is to, for extended source like a, a massive star cluster, what you can do is to do some rings at different distance from the cl cluster center. And in these rings, you can calculate the gamma ray emission at different rings and then reconstruct a kind of prof uh, radial profile of the gamma ray emission from the uh, massive star cluster. This is very interesting because this uh, can allow you to, to probe the way cosmic rays are escaping from the cluster, so into the interstellar medium, how they propagate around the, the cluster. And then, uh, of course, we will uh, expect to find new clusters and evaluate the contribution of uh, massive star cluster to the whole cosmic ray spectrum. That, I mean, here we, we may start to do with massive star cluster to do some astronomy. Actually, we have a, a few uh, cluster detection, but once you got a lot of source of uh, a different stage of evolution of the uh, same class, uh, you can start to uh, do some uh, more um, uh, uh, statistical studies, let's say, for instance, and evaluate properly if uh, most uh, of the massive star cluster you are detecting are really contributing uh, to the cosmic ray spectrum. And finally, uh, f to what concerns starburst galaxy studies, we can uh, have a better un understanding between the supernovae and the cosmic ray content, because, as I told you, these objects are producing a lot of supernovae. Okay. <clears throat> I can uh, give you more detail about what we are doing, but only orally, <laughs> sorry. So the conclusion of this uh, third stop is uh, that the quest of the origin of cosmic rays started more than uh, one century ago is not yet uh, rich. It's still some uh, one of the main unknown in uh, modern astrophysics. We know that cosmic rays are produced in events uh, which are associated with the death of massive stars. Um, and um, then we have to understand which are the most uh, main contributors of cosmic ray spectrum, either supernova remnants, which may be isolated or not, are, or massive star clusters. And so the technique uh, of the gamma ray detection by the Cherenkov telescope array, it uh, enters as a, in a new age, on a very highly sensitive uh, uh, instrument with uh, with a Chandrakov telescope array. And it should be greatly helps to answer these uh, still hot topics in our, in, in our field. Just to finish, here is a bibliography. If you want to go a bit further, I, there, there is a copper here of, um, of a link um, uh, I can provide uh, on demand uh, about the history of cosmic ray, cosmic ray research at CERN. Don't forget that, uh, in fact, cosmic ray research uh, starts with uh, particle physics. But no, particle physics starts with cosmic ray research. So the first particle we detected uh, um, uh, were in the cosmic ray. So until the 50s, when the, the accelerators start to, to go on. Um, there is also a nice, some nice uh, documents about the history of gamma ray telescopes and a brief uh, review of uh, historical supernovae, which is still interesting because this uh, go back with uh, the history of astronomy and when the, there have been a first, first report of uh, new objects in the sky all along the history. So that's all for me, and uh, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoy, and uh, I'm ready to answer any question, if I can answer. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for this uh, very complete and interesting webinar. Love not only the science part, but also the historical part. Yes, uh, I think so, I think it's imp it's important to uh, to know about history because this is what uh, how you learn how uh, a field can grow and uh, understand how ideas are progressing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And actually, as you mentioned during the webinar, this is a very young field. Mm. So it's it's important to talk about it and the discoveries that reach us to the point we are right now. So let's start with the question and answer session. So to all attendees, if you have any question, any doubt for Alexander, don't hesitate to, to put it in the comments on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, right now, at least until I go live, I didn't see anything, any comments, but let me actually ask you myself one comment, Alexander, because I got um, curious. I would like you maybe to describe um, to, to the participants how the, the working groups work within CTA and actually um, what are you working on right now? If you can say anything, if you can share some uh, results. Okay, uh, actually what we are doing, we are, in fact, um, we are in the, so the instrument is not yet constructed. So what we have to do first is to, um, to do some uh, some tests and uh, let's say to provide uh, the collaboration with let's say some synthetic uh, observation. So, what we should expect from the source, uh, and then uh, of course it is much based on the previous detection by this uh, S and uh, Magic and Veritas, and then. Um, from that, you can adopt some model uh, of uh, gamma ray emission, and so you mix them up, and then you provide some synthetic uh, uh, data. So, what we should get from the from the instrument, and also, um, actually, we are really in the in the phase of uh, finalizing the the array configuration. Uh, if I can back come back here. In fact, actually, the way the different type of telescope are display on the ground is not yet completely fixed. So, depending on the on the configuration, uh, uh, if uh, if you have a more or less a large telescope and uh, this is fixed, but uh, the way they are, they are configured from each other, they are placed from each other, is matter about the sensitivity at different uh, wave bands. So, this is actually the work we are doing is to from these synthetic uh, maps to evaluate the the best uh, configuration we can we have for each site uh, in order to have the the, the 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 best sensitivity to detect the source this is our job for now and also to write some uh, some reports and paper to, <laughs> to get uh, the external community uh, informed about what we are we are doing Perfect. Thanks a lot. So to see the optimized uh, configuration for, for this, I understand. So uh, we don't have any question. We have a comment congratulating you. But uh, I guess everything was super clear from your side. Uh, so thanks Things again. For... Yeah, for me, but I'm not sure it was clear for everyone. But uh, of course, it's, <laughs> a difficult, uh, it's still difficult to, to jump in uh, such technical aspect. So I've tried to be as clear as possible. But uh, I think you, you succeed. Yeah. So thanks again, uh, Alexander. And to all participants, just a reminder, we have the fourth stop. We are approaching the fourth stop in July, in mid-July. We are going to discover sources in, in our own galaxy. So don't forget, to follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe here in YouTube. So you have all the information for our next webinar. And with this, thank Alexander. Thank everybody for joining us. And see you in the next webinar. Ciao, ciao. Bye.